Hello again from Digicore Things. In a couple of earlier videos, I presented my 6809 CPU card design for the Minimalist Europe card bus. After creating that card design, I discovered it was actually a lot easier to find external clock 6809E CPU chips than it was to find the original internal clock chips, which is what my earlier card design required. This does of course make sense, given that most of the personal computers which use the 6809 processor were designed around the external clock 6809E variant. You can view the videos covering my difficulty attempting to source original internal clock 6809 or 6309 chips, where I received only incorrectly remarked chips. On the basis of this, I decided I should create an updated 6809 CPU card design, one which would be compatible with either the internal or the external clock CPU chips. This requires the addition of a circuit for an external quadrature clock generator, and also a jumper to allow disconnecting the crystal oscillator's direct connection to the CPU itself. With this new design, by inserting the jumper, but not the clock generator chip, the board is compatible with the original internal clock 6809. Alternatively, by removing the jumper and inserting the clock generator chip, the board is now suitable for the easier to find external clock 6809E CPU. Whilst making these changes, I also took the opportunity to update the CPU card's reset circuit, as I described in more detail in my previous video titled Optimizing our retro CPU reset design. The result is my version 2 6809 CPU card, which now supports either the Motorola 6809 or Hitachi 6309, as well as either the Motorola 6809E or Hitachi 6309E external clock processors. I'll now present the updated schematic updated PCB design, and then I'll assemble and test my first PCB. So let's take a look at the schematic. Firstly, as you can see, based on some earlier feedback, I've updated my schematic to now utilise bus connectors to make the circuit easier to follow. Other than this, the changes to the earlier design are basically just the inclusion of the quadrature clock generator circuit based on a dual JK flip-flop, the 74LS76. A CPU jumper to allow disconnection of the clock signal from the CPU chip for the 6809E CPUs. And the simplification of the reset circuit to now utilize the TC1232 8-pin dual inline microprocessor monitor chip. Now let's take a look at the updated PCB layout. You can see that the PCB layout hasn't changed much. Basically, because the clock generator and the updated reset circuits both fit in the same PCB space that was previously required for just the original reset circuit. Nice. So the updated PCBs were ordered from JLC PCB and they have now arrived. Let's take a look at one and get the first one assembled. Right, let's move this video lead out of the way, make a bit of room. Here's my box from JLC PCB, and inside we have my 6809 PCBs. And some 2023 stickers. Right. Let's have a look at one of these. Radio. Here we have the component side of the PCB. Looks nice. And I flip it over, here you can see the solder side. Okay, let's get the first one assembled. Of 
For assembly, I started off with the bypass capacitors and the two single inline resistor packs. Then I soldered in the IC sockets, including an 8 pin IC socket that I've modified for the crystal. 4 pin crystal sockets are relatively expensive, but as I did when assembling my earlier 689 CPU board, I modified a regular round pin IC socket for the purpose by popping out the centre 4 pins, leaving just the 4 corner pins. I then also soldered in the ROM write enable and the 6809 CPU 2 pin headers. Then the 8 way dual line switch and the momentary switch for the reset. Finally, the male DIN 41612 MECB bus connector, which is secured in place with a couple of 10mm M2.5 volts. With the board assembly completed, it's time to get some ICs inserted. As we have some tested known good ICs on the original version 1 6809 card, I'll just move those over. So if I grab the old card out of the back plane, let's move some ICs across. First the 748CT688 8-bit comparator. Then the 64K static RAM. And then our internally clocked 689 CPU chip. Next, the 4 MHz crystal oscillator to run the CPU at 1 MHz. leave the clock generator chip uninstalled for now as we're first testing the new version 2 board with the same original internal clock 6809 CPU that we used in the earlier CPU card. Finally, I'll also move across the program PLD and ROM chips that we had previously used for configuring and testing the earlier CPU card. And then we can add our new TZ1232 8 pin Jordan 9 chip for our compact no additional external components reset solution. The last thing 
is to insert the jumper to feed the crystal oscillator clock directly to the internal clock 6809 CPU. With the version 2 CPU card now ready to go, we can now insert it into our backplane alongside the TMS9929 video card for its first test. OK, so I have another camera which I've set up pointing at my monitor which currently has a blank screen. So let's apply power and see what we get. Ooh, OK, we get nothing. Let's try a reset. Still nothing. OK, we'll call that a fail. Obviously I've got something wrong. Let's have a closer look. So let's turn it off and I'll take the card back out so we can have another look. First I'll check that all the ICs are in their sockets correctly. Now the pins got bent over. Okay. I've just realised what I did wrong. I haven't um, selected the IO bank select switch to replicate what we had on the original um, CPU board. So that of course means it certainly won't work. So let's fix that. We need to turn on pins 4 to 8. OK, now both cards are set up the same for the same I.O. bank select. Let's try that again. Cards inserted. I'll just turn on the um, camera again. Right, let's once again apply power and see what we get. Power on. And success. We have the video test screen um, from the program in the ROM, the same as we had with the original CPU card. Let me try the reset. Okay, that's looking good. Okay, so now to try the CPU card, configured for the more common 6809E external clock CPU. Okay, let's turn her off. I'll take the old CPU card out of the way. I'll take out the new CPU card. And first we'll take out the internal clock CPU. And also remove the 6809 CPU jumper. Then we'll insert the 74LS76 JK flip flop chip for the portraiture clock generator. Finally, we'll insert a external clock CPU. Now I've actually got the same CPU here that I rubbed the incorrect markings off. 
in a previous video. That was a chip that I'd bought as an internal clock processor, but when I'd cleaned off the markings, it was actually a um, Itachi 63B09E CPU. So by using this chip, we'll be testing an external clock CPU and also the Hitachi 6309 equivalent. Actually, I think that needs the pin straightener. Okay, let's try that again. So, with our external clock, Hitachi HD 6309E processor, now installed, we're ready to do our second test, which is the test of the CPU board with the external clock generator. So let's first insert the CPU card back in the back plane. Then I'll turn on the camera that's pointing at the monitor. Okay, let's turn it on and see if we get anything. Power on. Okay, let's try reset. Okay. So it looks like our second test of the external clock CPU is a fail. Since the only thing that's changed is the use of an external clock generator, and we know the CPU card was working fine with the internal clock CPU. Um, the most likely problem is with the clock generator. So let's have a closer look. Right, I'm going to turn it off because I might um, move the CPU card to the horizontal connector and it'll make it easier for us to access the test points. So I'll just move this over here. I'll hook up a scope to our clock generator and see what's going on. So I'll put on this IC test clip, which will make life easier. I'll turn off our monitor cam. Right, let's bring in the oscilloscope test leads. I'll borrow an earth point from the bus. And we want um, to measure E and Q clocks. They are present on pins 15 and 16 of the JK flip-flop. So let's hook them up. Rightio, we should be ready to go. Let's turn on power and see what we get. Well, there's our problem. We're not getting the quadrature clock generated as we were expecting. Instead, we're getting a 1.33 MHz clock signal instead of the expected divide by 4 1 MHz. So we're getting a divide by 3, and the reason is the E and the Q clock appear to be a 33% duty cycle. So we'll need to understand this a little bit more. Okay, I next swapped out the 74LS76 flip-flop and also tested the chip to ensure it is not a faulty part causing the issue. Before continuing, I'll just say that this is turning into a good lesson for young design engineers. I've been doing this for a long time, so I should know better. But the reality is that when you've been doing this for a while, you can easily get a bit overconfident and take shortcuts. To explain what I mean, the quadrature clock circuit I've used originates from the official Motorola datasheet for the 6809E. The same circuit is also replicated in the official Hitachi datasheet for the 6309E. Here is the circuit as shown on page 12 of the Motorola 6809E datasheet. Note that the memory ready function of the circuit is optional, and if not used, the set and clear inputs of the 74LS76JK flip-flop 
should all be tied high, as I've done. Reviewing the dual JK flip-flop circuit, it certainly does look like a reasonable circuit for generating an appropriate divide by four quadrature clock. So this is the lesson. Even though we are using an officially recommended circuit, a good designer should analyze the circuit further and ideally also verify that the circuit actually functions as expected before going ahead with designing and manufacturing a circuit board. The first observation is that the circuit specifies a 74LS76, whereas my flip-flops are 74LS76A. Referring to the data sheet, the A suffixed variant has a subtle difference. The non-A variant states that the JK input is loaded while the clock is high and transferred on the high to low clock transition. The J and K input should remain stable while the clock is high whereas the A variant is simply negative edge triggered. Now I ordered my 74LS76N chips from AliExpress but received 74LS76AN chips. I suspect that as 74LS76 are now all recovered chips, it will be difficult to find non-A variants, as the AliExpress suppliers probably don't recognise the difference. Despite this difference, after I studied the data sheet, would have still expected the 74LS76A to function in this circuit. Here is my reasoning why. Firstly, I've put together this diagram to show the expected output of the circuit, together with the output that we are actually getting. Analyzing the output we're getting, we can see that when the E and Q outputs are both high during the falling edge of the clock, both outputs simultaneously transition to low. In all other cases, the outputs behave as expected. Now in this circuit, for a simultaneous transition of both the E and Q outputs to low, would seem to require a low input level on one flip-flop to be simultaneously clocked through both flip-flops. As one flip-flop's output is connected to the other flip-flop's input, and there is a propagation delay as well as a minimum data setup time requirement, it seems that this shouldn't happen. Note also that the set and clear inputs are all permanently tied high. According to the SN74LS76A data sheet, the propagation delay is typically 15 nanoseconds and the input setup time prior to the clock falling edge is a minimum of 20 nanoseconds. So from this, I would surmise that an input level change at the input of either flip-flop should only clock through that single flip-flop on the next clock falling edge. So now I'll do what I should have done in the first place. I'll put together the intended circuit on a breadboard so that I can observe and verify its operation. Okay, I'll first disconnect the scope from the CPU board move that out of the way and I'll slide this back to make a bit of room take off the test clip right here's my breadboard circuit which I've put together So I've replicated the quadrature clock circuit on the breadboard. Let's hook up the scope. Alright, I'll plug the scope in. Um, pins 14 and 16 were the outputs. So I'll hook that up to the breadboard. And let's get some power. Obviously the oscillator would help, so I'll just unplug the power and grab the oscillator from the circuit board and move it across to the space I made on the circuit board. Right, let's supply power again. 
And as you'd expect, I'm still getting the 33% duty cycle 1.33 MHz clock. Not what we want. So my current theory is that the 74LS76A is allowing a high to low transition as an input to be simultaneously clocked through both the sequentially connected flip-flops even though the required minimum data setup time for the second flip-flops input could not have been met. So next I took a look at what other JK flip-flops I have available in my parts drawers. Since we don't actually need the set input function, I found that I have some 74 HCT 73 dual JK flip-flops. These have the benefit of being a currently manufactured part. They have a higher drive capability and are also only 14 pin instead of 16 pin as they don't provide the set function which we don't need anyway. Otherwise these appear similar to the 74LS76A being also negative edge triggered but hopefully their behaviour in particular with regard to specified minimum input setup time adheres to expectations. So let's try out on the breadboard a similar quadrature clock circuit but based on the readily available 74HCT73 chip. Here is the schematic I've drawn up based on the 74HCT73. It is basically identical to the original 74LS76 circuit with the exclusion of the set inputs and of course in a 14 pin pinout. Okay, here is my breadboard again but with the 74HCT73 circuit added. Let's apply power once again and see what we get on the scope. E and Q are pins 12 and 14 respectively. So let's hook those up. Pin 14, pin 12. And we are looking good. We now have the expected 1 MHz 50% duty cycle quadrature clock. This is great news. I'm still not sure why the 74LS76A based circuit exhibited that strange behaviour, but I'm certainly happier to instead use the 14 pin still in production 74HCT73 as an updated 6809E external clock generator. So the last thing I'll do for today's video is now patch across the replacement clock generator to our new CPU card so we can test it's now fully operational. I'll just need to wire 5 pins of the 74LS76 socket to bring power and the clock across to the breadboard and then to return the 74HCT73 generated Q and E clock outputs. So let's get that done. OK, with that done, let's once again try our external clock CPU test. First I'll turn back on the camera, pointing at my monitor. Now let's turn on the power and see what happens. And finally, we have our working video display test output. Let's just hit reset. So at least we can close this video with some success. So the next step for me will be to update my version 2 CPU card design to instead utilize 74HCT73 as the external clock chip along with an earlier missing reset pull-up resistor connection oversight, I'll then be at board revision 2.2. Some of you might have spotted the jumper wire bodge for the reset pull-up on the back of the circuit board. With testing complete, I now expect version 2.2 to be the final internal or external clock version of my 6809 CPU card. And being finally happy with my 6809 CPU card design, I'll next move on to my first I.O. card for the Minimalist Europe card bus. I intend this to be a Motorola based I.O. card to faithfully team up with my 6809 CPU card. 
This will at last deliver my modular PCB based update of my original 80s YRAP Eurocard 6809 system. But now with a full 64 kilobytes of populated memory space, IO function separated from the CPU card, and address mapped configuration flexibility. But until then. That's it. Thanks for watching.